Go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Rina Agarwal, uh, Vice Provost for Faculty at Georgetown University and Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Uh, it's wonderful to see how this uh, global virtual fintech seminar series has uh, continued and the amount of uh, interest in it. Uh, today, we have a very special kind of a talk. We have uh, Itai Goldstein from Wharton, and the title of his talk is Financial Market Information and Corporate Finance, an Overview with New Perspectives for the Fintech Revolution. And he's going to present his views regarding the future of fintech uh, finance research in general, but, uh, but really related uh, to fintech. So the, this should be a very interesting presentation, a little bit different from the typical paper presentations that we've done in the last few weeks. And as we go forward, we are going to kind of mix things up a little bit and uh, try different formats that are more suitable for different kinds of uh, presentations. So as most of you know, uh, Professor Goldstein is the Joel S. Uh, Aaron Kranz Family Professor Professor of Finance, Professor of Economics, and also coordinator, coordinator of the PhD program at the Wharton School. He has been the executive editor of uh, RFS since 2018. His research interests include financial crisis, corporate finance, financial institutions, and financial markets with a focus on feedback effects between firms and financial markets. The recordings of all our previous seminars, they're available on our website. Uh, please uh, feel free to visit our website and also follow our uh, Twitter handle at GU Fin Policy. We are most grateful to our sponsors and partners for supporting the center. And we're able to continue with this uh, seminar series, uh, partly because of their help. And uh, I am going to turn this off uh, to Itai. And again, as we've done in the past, uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask questions as we go along. Uh, use the chat feature. Or, Ita, do you no, prefer? No, actually, at the end. So oh. let's, uh, let's keep the questions all at the end. It sounds good. So this time around, we'll keep the questions uh, for the end. And you can use uh, the raise your hand feature, the chat feature, whatever you like. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Itai and we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you see my slides? Uh, no, share the screen. No, okay. Uh, oh, I, I didn't see, uh, yeah, right. I think now it should be okay. No, it's fine, perfect, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me get this. It now? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, okay. Uh, very good. Um, and you hear me fine, right? Yeah, perfectly. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here vir virtually and to give this uh, talk. Uh, and uh, when Alberto and Rina in invited me to, to do that, uh, basically what they suggested is that I give a general talk uh, around the theme that I've been working on for years, uh, which is the feedback effect between financial markets and corporate finance, and then link it uh, to FinTech. Um, and I thought that's a good idea. Uh, this is something I've been working on and thinking about uh, for a long time. Uh, and it's also something that I've been uh, giving uh, talks uh, recently. Um, and, and it is related to, to FinTech. Um, so, so the way that I will uh, structure it today is I will give you a, an overview that is based of one of uh, the recent uh, talks uh, that I've given uh, in this area. Um, and then towards the end, I will tell you how I think some of these issues are affected by uh, by fintech. Uh, and I will say, you know, fintech is obviously a very broad definition. It includes many things. Um, the aspect of fintech that I'm going to focus on 
is information. The way that uh, FinTech creates uh, new sources of information, uh, broader availability of information, uh, better processing of information. And there is some really interesting work uh, recently on how these things are affecting the dynamics uh, between uh, financial markets and corporate finance. And I will leave that uh, to the end, okay? Um, so uh, the outline that, that I'm gonna follow, I'll talk uh, in the beginning in general, how I think about the interaction between corporate finance and financial markets. Um, I will tell you that I think a very important aspect, if not the most important aspect of this interaction is the information that is conveyed by prices uh, and how it affects uh, decision makers in the real side of the economy that affect uh, corporate decisions. I will focus a lot on how managers uh, respond to information in uh, financial markets, but I will very briefly broaden the scope and told, tell you it's not just about managers, it's also other decision makers, other uh, markets. Uh, this is really a broad uh, phenomenon. I will then talk about how this, I think, creates a new paradigm for thinking about uh, financial markets. Uh, what I think of as the feedback loop, whereby information in financial markets affect the real economy at the same time that financial markets are reflecting what's going on in the real economy. And I will briefly talk about some of the theoretical implications that are coming out of this. And then I will tie it to the FinTech revolution. And using some of the insights that I developed in the beginning, I will tell you what I think we need to look for when we are evaluating the way that financial technology and the vast uh, information that is becoming available because of the financial technology, how this is affecting financial markets and uh, corporate finance. Okay, so let me get started with the interaction between corporate finance and uh, financial markets. And as I mentioned, this is something that I've been uh, thinking about for many years and something that has motivated my research uh, for many years. And there are many people who are thinking about it, not just in academia, but also in, in practice. And, and this was always a good inspiration to, to draw on. Uh, one is a quote from George Soros, and he's been someone who has been promoting this view for uh, a long time. Uh, and for example, here he says, in certain circumstances, financial markets can affect the so-called fundamentals, which they are supposed to reflect. Basically saying that when we think about financial markets, we have to think not only how they reflect what's going on in the new side of the economy, but also how the dynamics in the financial market affect what's going on in the real side of the economy. And this is really, an important connection between corporate finance and financial markets. You know, when we think about corporate finance, we think about the real side of the economy. Firms raise capital, invest, employ, produce, provide services. This is the real economy. When we think about financial markets, we think about traders who trade securities, uh, prices are formed. And if you think about the basic uh, paradigm in finance. Financial markets, according to this paradigm, are supposed to reflect the fundamentals in the real economy. Uh, the, the key question is why do we see them not only reflecting the fundamentals in the real economy, but also affecting uh, the real economy. And there are different views on, on that. One prominent view that has been uh, promoted by behavioral literature, I mentioned here a survey by Baker from 2009, uh, relies on uh, some source of, of irrationality in this connection between financial markets and uh, the real economy. And the general story there goes as follows, market prices move for some non-fundamental reasons uh, because of limited to arbitrage, there is limited capacity uh, to bring uh, prices back to fundamentals, and that implies that mispricing is not easily corrected. According to this view then, opportunistic managers are going to take advantage of mispricing, and it ends up affecting their capital issuance and possibly other decisions. And as a result of this, shocks in the financial market 
end up affecting the real economy. Okay, this is really a, a big, a big literature. Um, I think that there is certainly a lot to, to this view, uh, but from the very beginning, what bothered me is that I think there are two very important omissions or limitations in this uh, story. Um, and one is that this really only applies to primary financial markets, not to secondary financial markets. The definition, in my view, of a primary financial market is when there is new capital issuance. Okay, so all this story here goes as follows. Uh, there is mispricing, you're going to take advantage of it and issue new capital. However, uh, it doesn't really apply to secondary financial markets. When there is just trading, prices go up and down, but no, no active issuance of capital, no active uh, move of capital from the market to the firm, if you want. And if you think about it, you know, primary financial markets are obviously important, but really the vast uh, activity that is happening in financial markets is happening in secondary markets, where there is not necessarily capital flowing, uh, but uh, still prices are moving up and down and uh, they seem to have an effect. People pay a lot of attention to them and they seem to have an effect. So that's one aspect that was missing in, in my opinion. Another aspect that is missing is even if you think about primary financial markets, this view can tell us uh, a lot about maybe capital issuance, but it's not so easy to take this to then explain what happens to important real variables such as investment, employment, and production. In other words, if firms want to take advantage of mispricing, they can do that by issuing capital, but it doesn't have to translate to investment and other real variables. So the way I've been uh, thinking uh, about this related uh, phenomenon, and here I mentioned a survey that I wrote in 2012 with Philip Bond and Alex Edmonds that summarizes a lot of this literature, obviously up to that point, a lot in this literature has been updated uh, and, and, and a lot of new research came since then. Um, but the way that we thought about it is that the real effect of secondary financial markets relies to a large extent on the informativeness of market prices. The fact that market prices contain important information that can guide decision makers uh, when they make all sorts of decisions such as uh, investment, okay? We talk about two possible channels uh, that are going on. Uh, we say both of them rely on information in prices. The first, which I've been emphasizing just now is that decision makers in the real side of the economy learn new information from markets that guides their decisions. So there is some, something new they see in the market that guides their decisions. Uh, the second, which is a bit more subtle, is that compensation contracts for real decision makers are tied to market prices. And this is the way their incentives and ultimately their actions are affected, okay? Uh, we say that this is also a result of information because really the only reason to base compensation on market prices is that they are uh, informative. Um, so, so this is the general background. Let, let me dive a bit deeper into what I think of as learning from prices. Who learn from prices? Why do they learn from prices? Um, what kind of information are they looking for in prices? What kind of empirical evidence we have? to support uh, this, uh, this view. So the basic idea behind uh, the informativeness of prices goes back at least to, to Hayek uh, in, in 1945, uh, basically saying that prices are key sources of information for guiding production and allocation decisions. He talks about prices in general, not necessarily financial market prices, but the arguments apply very directly to financial market uh, prices. And, and the basic thought is, you know, prices aggregate information from many different traders. Uh, <clears throat> as a result, they can provide a new source of, of information, okay? Without this market mechanism, it will be difficult to generate this source of information, to aggregate all these different pieces of information that come together into uh, the price, okay? 
Now, it's, it's really uh, just, I think, a small step to say, you know, if prices are containing all this useful information, then this useful information should guide decisions uh, that are made by managers and, and others. And, and this is the basic premise behind the feedback effect literature that I will uh, get to in, in a second. Now, obviously, there is a large debate in financial economics. Are prices informative or not? Uh, I picked here two prominent uh, sites that say yes, prices contain a lot of new useful information. Uh, if you want, for example, uh, this uh, Wolf of Zizovich uh, paper here is a review of a very large literature on prediction markets, uh, basically advocating that prediction markets will be a very useful way to generate information that could be useful to, to decision uh, makers. Okay. So the feedback effect. Again, if there is a lot of information in market prices, it's natural to expect that decision makers in the real side of the economy are going to make use of this information in their decisions. Okay. Um, when you think about what prices may be useful, usually we think about uh, stock prices, but it's really beyond uh, just uh, stock prices. It's also futures prices, bond prices, depending on the context. When you think about who can learn from prices, you can think about many decision makers who are affected by what's going on in the firm and affect by, uh, what, what is going on in the firm. I will talk a lot about managers learning from prices, but it can just as well be creditors, regulators, customers, and em employees. Now, it's important to note as long as there is some information in the price that they don't know, they will be affected by market prices and by what they infer out of market prices. Okay, so the usual argument against managers learning from market prices is, look, managers know so much about their own firms, why should they learn from prices? And what I will argue is, yes, they know a lot. Probably the manager knows more than any other single individual out there. However, what is important to note is even though they know a lot, there is still a lot that they could potentially uh, learn. Okay, there are some dimensions um, involving, I would say, soft information, uh, strategic analysis, uh, trying to understand market trends, demand for the firm products, and so on, on which managers don't have really that precise information and they can benefit from the aggregation of use that is coming uh, from uh, the market. Okay. So much of the literature focuses on managers learning from stock prices. Uh, I will talk a little bit about this now, uh, but then I will also briefly mention how the scope can be expanded to include other agents learning from market prices. Okay. Uh, another quote, uh, Farmer and Miller, 1972, basically telling us, you know, uh, an efficient market has a very desirable feature. In particular, at any point in time, market prices of securities provide accurate signals for resource allocation. That is, firms can make production investment decisions and so on. So really, uh, the, uh, the idea is, is, uh, has been accepted, I would say, early on that we care about information in prices to a large extent because we think the information in prices can affect important uh, real uh, decisions, okay? Um, you know, if you look for anecdotes, I think there are many anecdotes you can think of. Um, one that I've been uh, using uh, from the context of mergers and acquisitions, an attempted acquisition of Quaker Oats by uh, Coca-Cola back in 2000, the announcement of it sent the market down uh, 8% and then 2% the next day. Uh, then there was a meeting uh, of the Coca-Cola board that decided to reject the acquisition following the market response. Now, they would not say explicitly they did it because of the market, but a lot of the commentary around the time suggested that they were affected by the market uh, reaction. Uh, a bit of a different dynamics, but also uh, pointing to the effect of uh, a price on an acquisition decision is the HP acquisition of, of Compaq uh, around the same time, slightly later. Okay, I will say in general, mergers and acquisitions have been 
a very good place to think about learning from market prices. Because if you think about an acquisition, it is a very well-defined event. It is very clear what you're going to do and market is focusing attention on it, on it and then managers can take the reaction in the market to learn something about what the market thinks the prospects are and affect their decision. You know, this has been one of uh, the settings where empirical evidence has been uh, found for the presence of this uh, feedback. Okay, so these are just general anecdotes. You know, recently we did something very interesting, which is survey. Um, and um, Lian Yang, my long time co-author, uh, brought it to my attention and then we collaborated with people in, in China um, to basically go and ask CEOs of Chinese firms, what do they think about market prices and in what way market prices affect them? One really nice thing about this setting is the response rate, which is close to 100%. Basically, this is a survey that is conducted uh, in, in China on a regular basis on different issues. And we use the opportunity to include questions about information in financial markets and the way that they affect uh, firms. The, the response is really strong and suggesting that uh, CEOs of Chinese firms care about market prices and think that there is important information in them. So for example, here in this question, uh, a vast majority, 84%, say that they care about the price of their own firm and they also care about the price of other uh, similar uh, firms, okay? When you go into details to ask them, you know, why uh, do you care about the price? The first uh, answer here is that the stock price contains information that is new for investment decisions and you see a vast majority say that this is true, that they rely on stock prices because they think there is some information there that is relevant for investment uh, decisions. Not so many uh, point to the compensation channel as an important channel. Uh, more say that they care about it because they need to raise capital. This is, I would say, the primary market channel, but still the secondary market channel appears stronger. And then other things like pressure from the board or shareholders or merger and acquisition protection receive uh, less uh, traction in, in the data, in, in the survey. So um, th this is survey and anecdotes. If you go and look at large scale data uh, to try to find traces of uh, information in prices affecting uh, corporate decisions, there's obviously a, ch a challenge. You know, a naive way to, to go at it would be to say, let's look at whether prices are correlated with corporate investment. Well, obviously they are, but this doesn't say that prices affect corporate investment. Both of them could be high because of fundamentals, right? So the question is to try to tease out from the data whether the high correlation between prices and corporate investment is coming as a result of an active channel of learning. And a lot of the empirical evidence relies on the idea that investment to price sensitivity will be stronger in some cases than others, in particular when price informativeness is higher or when we have uh, a reason to believe that there is more information in price, you will expect a higher sensitivity of investment to price. So the majority of papers in the literature look at something along these lines. And I'm, I'm not going to go over them in, in details. There is a paper by Luo from 2005 that looked at that in the context of mergers and found support for the idea that managers are changing their behavior as a result of information in, in price. Um, there is a paper that we wrote in 2007 where we looked at general market microstructure measures of price informativeness to show that they are correlated with the sensitivity of investment to price. Um, there are papers by Thierry Foucault and Laurent Frassard uh, looking at cross-listed firms, which are firms that will have more information and as a result exhibit stronger sensitivity of investment to price. And they also looked at learning from peers 
as another channel um, to, to show uh, this feedback effect. And finally, a recent paper by Alex Edmondson and co-authors uh, looking at changes in insider trading laws as shocks to the amount of information available in price and, and show that this indeed affects the way that firms conduct their investment. There are also some evidence that are based on mispricing. The idea here is even if managers are learning from prices, occasionally prices are going to move for non-fundamental reasons and will still affect investment because managers and others are not sure when prices are moving for fundamental versus non-fundamental reasons. Conceptually, this is really the best way to kind of provide clean identification because uh, the uh, exclusion restriction is more likely to hold. If prices move for non-fundamental reason, and there is no reason for this non-fundamental issue to affect other corporate variables, then showing that there is a response of other corporate variables to the price is kind of a direct evidence of the effect of the price on uh, corporate investment or other corporate variables. Um, I will not go into details here. Uh, I will just say that this literature exists. There's some debate uh, on, on how to measure mispricing and, and so on, but that's not the focus of my talk today. So I will uh, leave it at, at this, okay? So this is about managers learning from prices. Um, I think I should try to go faster so that I get to, uh, to have a few minutes to talk about uh, fintech and how it's affecting the, the dynamics. So let me just say, you know, one can broaden the scope and that has been done in the literature to talk about other decision makers learning from prices, including policy makers, regulators, uh, board of directors, credit rating agencies, lenders, and, and so on. And one can also talk about other types of markets and prices. Most recently, the commodities futures market came into attention uh, because of the potential information that it uh, provides. Let me say a few words about what I would call um, the feedback loop and the way that this feedback effect creates a theoretical paradigm for thinking about financial markets and corporate finance. I will highlight here an important insight uh, that has been guiding me for a long time. And I will come back to this insight when I talk about FinTech and how we should think and evaluate uh, FinTech in this uh, context, okay? So when you think about the implications uh, for, for theory, um, again, the main thing I would like to highlight from what I said so far is, you know, prices reflect and affect cash flows at the same time. Traditional models of financial markets, if you go back to Grossman Stiglitz, Kyle, Gloston, Milgram, and so on, do not capture this feedback loop because they will say, you know, firm cash flows are exogenous. Um, we only care about how the information about these cash flows is going to be uh, processed and aggregated in financial market. But we don't think about how this information then feeds back into the firm. The feedback effect papers will break this paradigm and consider the feedback loop between prices and, and cash flow. Okay. And in this survey that I mentioned to you in the beginning that we wrote back in 2012, we highlighted two main groups, I would say, of implications of this feedback loop for theoretical research, but also ultimately for empirical research on financial markets and corporate finance. One that is fairly broad, but most of the papers that have been written on the theory along these lines share this feature, is that usually when you incorporate the feedback effect into models of trading in financial markets, this changes basic predictions on price formation in financial markets. Okay, so in many of these cases, you can take a model of financial markets with no feedback effect and you derive certain results. And then one will show that 
when the feedback effect is introduced, those results are changing and you can give rise to a lot of interesting phenomena in financial markets like um, price manipulation or trading frenzies that otherwise would not uh, arise. The second broad insight, and this is the thing that I would like you to keep in mind, and I will take that to my discussion of the fintech uh, literature and how it's affecting financial markets, is when you think about this feedback loop, there are different notions of efficiency that are coming up. Uh, we defined it in the paper as forecasting price efficiency, FPE, versus revelatory price efficiency, RPE. The forecasting price efficiency is really, to what extent prices can forecast future cash flows. And I think this is really the traditional notion of market efficiency, right? Um, prices can forecast what will be the future cash flows. However, another notion, which we think is more important, but has been broadly neglected in the literature, is the revelatory price efficiency, RPE. And this is the extent to which prices reveal information that is useful to decision makers and can improve the efficiency of decisions that are made by decision makers in the real side of the economy. If you want, you can call it real efficiency. Now you will say, okay, market efficiency, real efficiency, they're probably always aligned. But one of the interesting insights that is coming out of this literature is that no, they're not always align. And in fact, there are cases where market efficiency comes into conflict with uh, real efficiency. Okay, let me give you a very a brief uh, example. Um, suppose that there are two dimensions of information and one of them, the manager is already, already knows pretty well. The other one, the manager doesn't know so well, but is trying to learn from the market. If the market is focusing on what the manager already knows, you're gonna have very nice market efficiency, high market efficiency, FPE. However, that information is completely useless from the point of view of managers because the market already tells them what they know. So in some sense, what you care is not that the market can predict what will happen, rather what you care is that the market will provide the kind of information that is missing and that could increase the efficiency of real investment decisions. And when I come to the FinTech uh, point, I will highlight this as something that I think is important to keep in mind, okay? Um, so I talk here about a few of the theoretical papers and the insights that they derive. I'm gonna skip this because I think I have only five minutes uh, before uh, questions. So I, I wanna now, devote this next five or six minutes to talk about the, the fintech revolution and how I think it is related to what I, I just uh, discussed. Okay, fintech. So what is fintech? Uh, obviously fintech is a broad phenomenon, broad definition, including new technologies in different parts of the financial sector. I'm gonna focus on one dimension of fintech, which I think is very important. You know, when we did the FinTech initiative at the RFS, we started it in December, 2016, leading to a special issue that was published in May of 2019. Um, it was a good chance to get input from the field on what people think FinTech is, because, you know, we had a call for proposals. We got a lot of proposals. Analyzing what kind of proposals we got, we could see what is FinTech, or at least how is it defined? in the field. My interpretation at the end of all this is a big part of FinTech is about information. One of the key topics in submissions we received was big data, uh, which is clearly about having more information and greater ability to analyze this information. If you do a world cloud out of all the submissions you re we received, you know, you will see that obviously FinTech tells you a lot about FinTech, but that's not surprising. Um, other words like platform are kind of expected, but you will see that some of the most important words that come up is information, ambiguity, 
efficiency, liquidity, all of them are related to things that I talked about uh, earlier. Okay, so I want to think about fintech as uh, more access to information and greater ability to analyze the information. So uh, new technologies enable investors in financial markets to rely on a lot more information when they trade. That's the, the starting point. Uh, existing information can be processed, analyzed, and aggregated much more quickly and effectively. Uh, big data, machine learning, or two buzz uh, words that are coming up here. Uh, basically saying, you know, we have new techniques to analyze big data, such as uh, machine learning, and uh, this will make more information available to more people. New sources of information, um, also shed light on dimensions that were previously unknown. For example, real-time information about consumer transactions, satellite images, and so on, provide investors opportunities to gain information into what's going on in the firm in real time. This was not possible before. So the question here is what are the implications? When you think about the fintech revolution as a revolution that increases the availability of data in financial markets, what are the implications? Obviously, the immediate instinct would be that um, more information will just be good. It will improve the efficiency of markets and resource allocation. However, based on all that I said so far, I would say that caution is required. First, improvement in, improvement in market efficiency is not guaranteed. We know from literature that new sources of information can crowd out old sources of information. I will mention here a very nice paper by Dugar and Foucault that basically say that fast, imprecise signals could replace slow but more precise signals. Um, so in some sense, maybe the fact that we have all this availability of fast uh, big data um, implies that there is less deep thinking uh, going on. Uh, the other thing, which, which has been the highlight of what I said uh, before, is that market efficiency does not automatically translate to real efficiency. And this is something that we have to keep in mind like what I mentioned to you before that was based on a paper that I had with Lian Yang. You know, suppose that uh, the market uh, uh, focuses on learning what managers already know, okay? Uh, then you can have great market efficiency, but that's not the real efficiency. You want the market to focus on what managers uh, don't know. And there is some nice recent work that is providing some empirical evidence and highlighting the nuances uh, involved. Um, you know, this is very, very uh, selected um, sample. There are more papers, but some things that kind of caught my uh, attention uh, recently, uh, a paper by Brian Weller that talks about algorithmic uh, trading, how it facilitates the incorporation of existing information into prices, however, reduces the amount of new information available, okay? A paper by Christina Zhu that came out in our FinTech special issue that basically says that firms that are more affected by the access to new sources of, of data, such as the consumer trans transaction or satellite images that I mentioned before, uh, they see an increase in price efficiency and investment efficiency. A recent paper by Farbudi, Matre, uh, Laura Veldkamp, and Venki. Uh, basically talks about the fact that the abundance of data contributed to market efficiency, but only in some firms, not in all, only in large growth uh, firms. And a very nice paper by Gowen and Huang that looked at an older uh, technology enhancement, uh, the introduction of Edgar uh, files that made available financial reports to a large uh, audience of investors, and they say it brings more informed trading and improves price efficiency. In current work that I'm doing, we actually look a bit deeper into this to look at the implications for real efficiency, which is what I emphasized before, to look at, uh, in my opinion, 
and we say that here the implications are less clear because the sensitivity of investment to price actually ha appears to have uh, decreased uh, as a result of these uh, changes. So let me uh, conclude um, a, a couple minutes uh, late, so let me do it uh, quick. Um, so what are the takeaways? What are the future directions? Uh, I think all these papers and others demonstrate the complexities involved with new, uh, newly introduced technologies. I think the tensions that I highlighted above, potential for crowding out and the tension between market and real efficiency are reflected in this work. Uh, in my opinion, there are many more opportunities to do empirical research along these lines. And this is because there are mixed messages. So we need to dig deeper to understand uh, how the different forces compare to each other, which one dominates when, and so on. And also because the abundance of new data sources and experiments, you know, all this data is becoming available and you can see how the abundance of data affects market prices, market efficiency, real efficiency. There are many opportunities to look into these issues. I, I would like to end with one concluding thought that hasn't really been explored that much in the literature, but I think is really interesting and something that we want to think about. Everything I described so far has looked into how the fintech revolution is affecting the financial market and via that affecting corporate uh, efficiency. However, one interesting dimension to think about is, you know, maybe all these new sources of information can replace the market at some point maybe the market is going to lose some of the prominence that it had as a source of information now that there are all these other new venues uh, through which information can be uh, aggregated and conveyed and and i think that that is certainly something to to think about uh, going forward so i'll stop here and i'm happy okay. to take questions Thank you so much, uh, Ita, for the great presentation. Uh, we already have a number of questions in the chat. If you want to ask questions directly to Ita using, um, <laughs> please feel free to uh, raise your hand. But we start, actually start from the last question from <coughs> Davidson Heath. And I think there are two questions. And the first one is, um, he says that ETFs now account for 30% of equity trading volume. Do you think the rise of passive investing plausibly affects the feedback relationship and in particular, the forecasting price efficiency and the regulatory price efficiency? Uh, yes, uh, I, th I think that's a, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, and indeed, this has been one concern uh, that came up over time, that the rise of passive investing is going to reduce active acquisition of information as a result might reduce uh, price efficiency, might also reduce uh, real efficiency. Um, and, and I think this is certainly something that, that is going on. You know, there, there is uh, a recent paper that, that I uh, remember now by uh, Maureen O'Hara and, and co-authors that, that actually says that there is maybe a potentially positive effect also coming out of this that we may want to, to remember uh, and this is that the fact that you have all these ETFs could allow traders who want to acquire information on individual firms to hedge more effectively and as a result encourage them maybe to uh, acquire information. So, so I, th I think there is this other side to it that we also uh, want to, to think about. Um, but again, I, I certainly think this is something interesting to, to look into uh, going forward. And then second question, always, uh, I think, around the similar um, spin um, is uh, if Davidson is asking, like, if fintech such as Robinhood brings in new uninformed noise traders, will this make things worse because prices become noisier or better because informed traders face less adverse selection? So again, can you repeat uh, what exactly? Okay, so if fintechs right, like, such as Robinhood uh, bring in new uninformed noise traders, mm -hmm. will this make things uh, worse because prices become noisier right. or better? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, I think this is an open question. I think when you look at a model, uh, you will probably get a, a result that says, you know, some amount of uninformed trading is good because it's necessary to keep the 
incentives of informed traders to, to trade. Um, okay, so there could be a trade-off. On the one hand, if you increase the amount of noise too much, prices could become very noisy, but increasing the amount of noise to some extent uh, could make prices more informative. So I think theoretically, there is uh, some tension and, and I can see it going uh, in different ways, uh, in, in different directions, um, in different ranges and different contexts. And, and I think ultimately this is an empirical question. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go to Coase John. Coase, uh, you are unmuted. You can talk. Hi. Hi, Itai. Hey. Okay. Uh, I have, you know, I have, a, this might be uh, something you might have worked on. Uh, let's say I'm a manager with a positive NPV project. I have monopoly access to the project, uh, but I am in a competitive, competitive market. Now I can get now I want to know how positive is the positive NPV. I can do a private market, let's say market survey, or I can get that information privately, or I can get it from it being reflected in the prices. Now the problem right. is, problem is uh, sometimes when I wait for the prices to reflect that information, I'm also encouraging probably entry into uh, uh, what I'm doing. In other words, I'm, I'm diluting my monopoly access to the project, which might have its own real effects. So, you know, are there situations where prices reflecting information is not the best way uh, for uh, <laughs> resource, uh, for even a resource allocation, because, you know, it, it becomes a different setting. I don't know whether you've worked on, I probably, you have a paper on this. I'm sorry <laughs> if, if that's the case. So. Um, I, th I think that's an interesting idea. No, I, I don't have a paper uh, that, that looks into this. Um, I think that's an interesting direction to think about. But basically what you're saying is, if I rely primarily on the price, which is a public source of information, Everybody then is watching. Yes. I, I have to take into account that other, other competitors are also watching and can learn the same information and could act. And then my competitive advantage could be lost to some extent. Yes. Uh, so maybe what I would like to do is improve uh, the mechanisms that uh, generate my own uh, in-house uh, information uh, and, and maybe depress the amount of information that is coming from, from the market. That, that, yes. that, is that what you're saying? That's yeah. right. That's right. Yes. And it, yes. yes. I think that's an interesting uh, thought. Um, and, and again, uh, I, I mentioned briefly, uh, you know, an empirical paper by uh, Foucault and, and Frassard that looks at learning from peers, uh, which they find to be an important channel that is going on in, in the data. Um, so th this is certainly something that is going on. Uh, but mm -hmm. the question is then, you know, if, if you are the peer, maybe you would like to make sure that your price is not so informative so that your uh, competitors are not learning from you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I, th I think that's interesting. Uh, certainly an interesting channel. Okay. Perfect. So let me go to, to another question that comes from Rina Agarwal. Uh, she's asking, is uh, the FinTech revolution just... Uh, kind of bringing more information or in your view or just uh, an easier availability of information on a central platform? So what is the kind of, uh, the, or is the combination of the two? Yeah, just, just to provide a context, right? I'm thinking more from the client side rather than the firm side. And uh, so if you think of, I wanna go get a mortgage loan and there's a platform that makes available what uh, financial institution A is offering and B is offering and C is offering in one space. So it's not more information, but for me as a client, it's available in one place, in one platform. Uh, so is it just more information? So certainly from the firm's point of view, that intermediary, the platform's point of view, there's more information about clients. But from the client's point of view, that information is out there, but I have easier access to it. It's just like a centralized stock exchange versus fragmented markets. 
Right, yes. In my opinion, the FinTech evolution really did both. And part of what I meant when I said that, you know, FinTech is broad and includes many dimensions um, also re relates to, to this. Uh, yes, I think FinTech did both. I think that on, on the one hand, as you say, it created platforms when information can be viewed uh, more easily and as a result can be acted on uh, more easily. Uh, but on the other hand, I do think that an important dimension of it is uh, just the fact that there is also new information that beforehand was not available. So I'll give an example of the satellite images of consumer transactions that, you know, beforehand, if you were just an investor in financial market, I, I don't think this is something that you could you could easily have access to and all of a sudden you have those uh, websites and services that are providing this information on a regular basis. So in my opinion, it's, it's both. And, and I don't really know how to tell which one is more important. I'm not even sure we can say that one is more important. I, I think both of them play, play a role. Perfect. Thank you, Senna. We have a question from Suresh, which uh, maybe is writing a paper on this, but he's asking, what is your take on using Google Trend data um, being used for understanding various financial market asset pricing and corporate finance questions? Um, so you, you, you say looking at a particular aspect of financial markets and then using uh, Google Trends to, to see how important that has been uh, over, over time? I, I think so. I'm not yeah. sure, but yeah, I think that's what he meant, yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Um, yes, uh, certainly. Um, you know, I, I, I certain, uh, there are empirical papers, as, as you probably all know, that, that looked into uh, related things. And I think that by and large, uh, they show that this is a, a, certainly a meaningful indicator uh, to look at uh, for, for a bunch of things. Um, now, now uh, as, as another source of information uh, for investors, yes, uh, certainly I, th I think this is something that uh, investors can use. Uh, although, you know, it is maybe not the most up-to-date thing that, uh, that you have, because in some sense, when you see that uh, something is going up in the trend, it's already after many market participants, uh, many players have already thought about it and, and, and looked for information on it. Um, so it's not the most proactive thing that, that you can do, but, but, but certainly uh, some, some kind of information. Okay, our next question comes from Francesco da Junto. Let me unmute you, Francesco. You can speak now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ita, for the for the great insightful talk. Uh, so I have a question just to follow up on what Rina was asking uh, earlier. Uh, so in a sense, well, mainly we have focused the, the discussion in the talk on uh, um, sort of gathering information and reacting strategically by firms in financial markets. But uh, one way in which, uh, at least I mean, appears to me the fintech revolution might really change uh, access to information is also on the retail side and especially in terms of household finance and consumption choices. So very kind of uh, small individuals that, uh, you know, earlier research finds often don't have any access to any type of information for, for this type of important uh, consumption saving decisions. And, and so one way and something I wanted to ask, I mean, what, what you might think about it is that, you know, that of course we know over the last couple of decades, there's been like this kind of big, uh, uh, controversies among uh, camps between kind of behavioral explanations and uh, rational inattention explanations of why some of these uh, non-expert uh, households uh, uh, make decisions that appear like mistakes exposed. So my impression would be that uh, given that the, you know, the rational inattention stories mainly focus on the fact that for many of these households, even understanding, interpreting, or elaborating information in some kind of prescriptive normative uh, decision they should take is very hard. So we, we have, for instance, some work with, with Michael Weber on IQ. We find that uh, until you are really in the very, very top of the IQ, the distribution, many of these households don't even understand what the percentage is. 
they don't cannot interpret even if we tell them numbers or what that means uh, literally um, but then i mean the availability of this information through fintech platforms especially the fact that this information is uh, they provide it to houses in a way which is very easily and vividly understandable. Could it potentially help us uh, to do some kind of uh, uh, advancement into this uh, sort of uh, uh, quarrel on whether households behave in a certain way because of rational attention, because they are not able to gather, or it's too costly for them to gather information, or whether indeed there's some form of uh, psychological or behavioral constraint in, in their behavior. So in a sense, it seems like this type of flame, if we, if we do observe that households do react meaningfully once information is really provided to them in a vivid way, then probably that would uh, sort of be a new way to sort of revive the, the rational inattention uh, camp or, or type of interpretations of these uh, uh, so-called mistakes. Yes, um, I think that's true. I, I think this is an interesting uh, thought uh, for, for future research. Um, you know, I, I haven't, in my own research, I haven't really looked much in, into households. Uh, most of what I've done is related to corporate finance, financial markets, uh, financial institutions. Um, but certainly there is a, a very large uh, fraction of, of, of the research uh, these days that, that is going in the direction of, of households and, and, and you've done uh, work on this um, and, and I think that exploring those ideas uh, how households respond to information uh, given that nowadays we have a lot more uh, a, a, a lot more sources of information that, that is available to them I, I think this is certainly a, a, a very uh, nice thing to, to think about uh, going forward. And, and I think that, you know, you, you're right that um, certainly something that has to guide you when thinking in those directions is to keep in mind what you think and what you can learn about the sophistication of households, their ability to process the data to learn from the data, um, you know, I, I think you mentioned limited attention, uh, you mentioned behavioral uh, biases. Um, I, I think, you know, to some extent, maybe there is also some element of sophistication uh, that, that is kind of related, but, but also a bit, a bit separate. It could be that there is a lot of information that is made available, uh, but only some, uh, participants can actually understand it and take advantage of it. Thank you. And actually I have, we are almost out of time, but I have a question for you. And this is kind of uh, more uh, for the, the young researchers here. So we know that uh, many of these uh, FinTech platforms or FinTech apps are allowing us to getting an incredible amount of information regarding their users. So how many people, <laughs> how people make decisions, how they acquire information, but in many cases, the, the decision to sign up for these um, platforms or apps are voluntary. So it's sometimes uh, not very obvious that uh, these populations are going to be necessarily representative. So as, a, as an editor, what is your view regarding uh, this point and what is your uh, kind of suggestion that you may have for young researchers doing their PhD dissertation, maybe working with apps? Yes. Okay, so, so you, you're basically saying that there is some selection bias that... There could be, or maybe not, but yeah, so that, but it's not necessarily a random sample of the population. Right, yes. I mean, I think this is definitely something you need to, to take into account when analyzing the data. You know, I would say a caveat and <laughs> trying to alleviate the concerns that are coming up in terms of interpretation and so on as, as much as possible. You know, it's not very different from other contexts and other data sets that, that people are using in the sense that you often find yourself with some kind of non-random sample for one uh, reason or, or another. Um, so so I, th I think it's definitely something that has to be uh, to be taken into account in, in interpreting the, the results. Okay, and then I think we have a, one last question and then we can, um, we can close it up. This comes from Zun Liu um, and he's asking from the perspective of firms, how do you know if uh, there is any evidence of uh, 
companies using fintech and making it useful for themselves. So uh, examples of research where uh, people have shown that fintech has been useful in helping companies making better decisions. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it, good question. I don't know such research, or at least I can't think of it uh, on top of my head right now. But but I do think it's it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Uh, you know, when you talk to corporate managers, uh, people in, in the field, everyone is intrigued by fintech. And I think many of them are just starting to kind of think about it and, and see how they can potentially use it for their uh, own benefit. Um, and I think this is an increasing trend. I think you see more of it now and, and you will continue to see uh, more of it in the future. Of course, assuming the current crisis is not changing everything. Um, so, so definitely that, that would be something interesting to, to think about. I'm not sure, you know, if you think about data availability for that, I, I don't know. I, I don't know any source of information that will tell you who is using FinTech and, and how. Uh, but you can certainly imagine that many firms can benefit for their own decision processes, can benefit from things like big data, machine learning, uh, things like that. Um, and, and, and certainly, I, I think many of them are beginning to think about it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let me thank uh, Itai for the wonderful and great and inspiring presentation. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that we will not have a seminar next week because of the WFA. We will resume on uh, Friday, June 26. Uh, we're going to have a slightly different format. So we're going to have three papers presented over 90 minutes. And every Friday, we will have a different topic. So we will start with uh, cryptocurrency related research. So we're going to call the first uh, day crypto day. And uh, we hope to see you there. Um, once again, uh, please follow us or our initiatives of the center. You can follow us on the website as well on Twitter at the GU Fin Policy. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you so much, Ita, again. Thank you very much.